Scripture lesson today comes from the book of Genesis. I love the Old Testament readings because the Old Testament always had the best stories. You know, there's plagues and locusts and angel armies and floods and destruction. It's like Game of Thrones. And it's, it's one of those wonderful... I enjoy the Old Testament a lot. The Old Testament comes from the book of, uh, book of Genesis, starting at chapter 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep, goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to you, my lord, that I might find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you with 400 men, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people with him into two groups, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels as well. He thought, If Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, and now I have to become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid that he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper." And will, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, and the, which cannot be counted. And he spent the night there, and from, and from what he had, he selected a gift for his brother, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys, and he put them in the care of his servants." each by herd to itself, and said, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. And he instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, Who do you belong to, and where are you going, and who owns these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. So it was the middle of the night, and Jacob was alone, staring into the fire. If you've ever stared into a campfire, you know how quieting that can be. And he was all by himself, could not sleep even though he had his bedroll with him, and he was terrified. Tomorrow, he would go and meet his brother Esau, who was probably going to kill him. His brother Esau, his older brother, brother, older brother by mere seconds. They were non-identical twins. But Esau was a big man. He had been a big baby, a big kid. And... Jacob's mother had often said that they fought with each other even when they were inside of her belly and that she would have to sing to them to get them to calm down. And they had fought for years. And Esau, the firstborn, was his father's favorite. Esau had gotten good that where even as a boy he could use a rock and throw it and bing an animal on the head and then go up and break its neck and then drag some meaty carcass back to camp and place it at his father's feet and the father would pat him on the back and say, that's my favorite son. Esau would look at Jacob and just smile. And Jacob grew to hate those smiles. And so Jacob had done what he had done. He had cheated his brother out of the family name and out of the family inheritance. And when he left, the last time he saw his brother Esau, Esau was on top of a mountain screaming his name as Jacob took the money and ran. And he did very well. He, he prospered. He became two camps with lots of animals and lots of wives and lots of servants. 
And then God said, time to go home. Atone, apologize, make up for what you've done. And so he sent his servants on ahead of him because he knew he needed this night alone. And he was so lost in his thoughts that he didn't see the stranger show up. Jacob just looked up, and there across the other side of the fire, there was a man who was sitting there just in the same position that he was, staring at him. But there was something different about him. Jacob stared at him for the long time, and the, the man on the other side sort of stared back, tilting his head like a child studying a new bug that he had found in the ground, just, just studying him. And suddenly he started to smile. Jacob looked at him. He, he, his skin, he had no facial hair. He had no lines on his face. He, he had a, young, a boy's face on a man, and his skin was as smooth as a statue. The hair that hung down out of his, his turban was white as snow. His clothes were, were not just clean, they were new. It was as if he hadn't existed a moment ago, and now he did. And Jacob looked at him and said, who are you? The man on the other side of the fire just smiled. Jacob moved his hand towards the knife he kept tied to his belt, and the man smiled as if he knew exactly what Jacob was thinking. Jacob said again, who are you? Still no answer, and Jacob thought he had had enough. I've given away all my stuff. I've got to go see my brother tomorrow. He's probably going to kill me, and now some alabaster-faced man-child comes to me in the middle of the night and wants to play games. And he stood up, and when he did, the man on the other side of the fire stood up and jumped and pushed Jacob to the ground, and the knife went fl floating away. And the man disappeared into the dark, and Jacob was back on his feet, and he was saying, Who are you? He didn't even hear him come at him from the side, and he jumped, and he pushed Jacob to the ground again. Jacob was back on his feet. This time, when the stranger jumped over the fire, Jacob saw the wings. Wings! Wings! The man had wings greater than those of a hawk, bigger than three of his camels standing side by side. Wings! The man came down and pushed Jacob to the ground. This time he landed flat on his back and all of the air went out of his lungs. And he lay there gasping for breath, but all he seemed to be able to do was inhale. When finally he got his breath back, he lay there, and the stranger came back into the firelight. Jacob looked up, and the wings had folded behind him, and he reached out his hand so that the man would help him up. And when the angel grabbed his hand, Jacob rolled and put two feet on the man's chest and flipped him backwards over, and he rolled off into the darkness, and Jacob was on his feet again. Now, now it was on. And he could hear from the darkness the angel laughing. He was having fun. Jacob picked up scoops full of sand and began throwing it onto the fire to put them in complete darkness. This was no longer ab about looking, it was about listening. Jacob knew when he played hiding games with his brother Esau. J Esau was too big and too clumsy. He couldn't hide. Jacob could listen. And he heard the man coming at him this time, and he grabbed him as he got close by the front of his robe, threw him off to the side, and they began to fight and to wrestle in the dirt. All night long they wrestled. And it was just towards the break of day, Esau, Jacob had the man on the ground with his knee in the man's chest as the sun was coming up. He said, you are a messenger from my God, and you will give me my blessing. 
The man reached up and with no more effort than it takes to pull a blade of grass from the ground, he pushed and dislocated Jacob's hip bone, popped it right out of its socket. Jacob roared in pain and he fell over on his back, pounding at the hip bone, trying to pop it back into its socket. The angel stood up and he put his hand on Jacob's chest and the pain went away. And he said, you have wrestled well. This is your blessing. Your name is no longer Jacob your name is Israel. And the angel disappeared and the pain came back and Jacob roared and pounded three times until finally the bone popped back into its socket. And he lay there on his back, breathing. The pain subsided and just became a dull Ache. And when the sun was fully up, he rolled over onto his belly and then slowly made his way onto all fours. And finally, he was on his feet, finding his walking staff. He rolled up his bedroll and began to walk towards the valley where he would meet the brother who was probably going to kill him. He thought, I'm going to see this brother I'm probably going to die today, and he's going to take all of my stuff, all of my wives, all of my children, all of my treasure, and I wrestled an angel of God who changed my name. Really, nothing surprised him anymore. One of the things that we don't always tell that goes along with that story is that the Jewish people used to believe that certain areas of your body controlled certain emotions. Intelligence was in your heart, not in your head. Intelligence was kept here. If you knew something to be true, you knew it with your heart. That's where that comes from. I know this is true. I know it with my heart. Your stomach is where we kept love. Yeah, all right. When you, when you fall in love, don't you feel all squishy inside? And I, yes, I use the word squishy. And if you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend or you lose someone out of your life or if there's a divorce or something, doesn't it feel like you've been kicked in the stomach? An ache that doesn't go... I'm not done. <laughs> I was gonna th doesn't it feel like you've been kicked in the stomach when you, when you lose somebody? That's because the love has been bruised from your navel to just, below, just above your knees, that's where pride was kept. <laughs> yes? I didn't have to say it. You thought the same thing I did. And yes, you're allowed to think that. You, that's, that's a legit, you're allowed to think that because that was part of it. Literally, that was part of it for men of that time. Pride was kept in that area. And the angel dislocated Jacob's pride before he could go and meet his brother. He had to have his pride dislocated. He also changed Jacob's name to Israel. And if you don't think names carry meaning, how many Adolfs do you still know? Peter, his name was Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter, Petra, which meant the rock. Saul had his name changed to Paul so he could be a new person and do what God intended for him to do. If you don't think names will change the person you are, talk to anybody in our church who just recently started being called Grandpa. Or grandma, doesn't that change who we are? Or the first time you get called sweetheart, or whatever those little lovey-dovey names is that we say for people that we are really close to, just in our own special place and time, that changes who we are. All right, I'm, I'm going to do this real quick. 
This is just for fun, okay? This is, we're we're going to do this a little bit like a youth meeting. I'm going to give you a name, and you're going to vote one way or the other. Is this the name of a biblical king or the name of a prescription medication? <laughs> Wait for Okay. Jakafi. Jakafi, biblical king, raise your hand. Prescription medication over here. It's a prescription medication. It's for bone marrow cancer. Okay. <laughs> Rehavam. Rehavam, biblical king. Prescription medication. Medication is for asthma. There you go. Chemesis. Chemesis, biblical king. Prescription medication. King of Persia in the year 530 BC. Uh, let's see. Laharium. Laharium, biblical king. Prescription medication. It's a, it's a vaccine for malaria. Paratha. Paratha, biblical king. Prescription medication. It's for calcium deficiencies. Okay. All right, last one, last one. Parkorum. Pacorum, biblical king, prescription medication. No, you're not even voting now. Look at you. <laughs> Pacorum was the king of Persia in the year 38 BC. Jacob's new name meant he was a new person. He had to become new in order to be able to do what God had called him to do. The struggle, the wrestling, made him new. I see that a lot on, on mission trips. When you take the teenagers away, you see them wrestling with what they're, what they're seeing, some of them for the first time. People think mission trips are about the work that gets done. It's not all, that's not all it's about. It's about watching our youth become new. Watching them become new people. The problem is, we don't always want to be new. We want to stay the way we are. We want to hang on to the baggage. Imagine if your baggage was actually literally baggage. We'd be carrying that around with us all the time. We'd hang on to it. Could be bus leaving now for brand new paradise, but no bags. How many of us would miss the bus because I'm going to hang on to this. This is my, it's my pain. It's my guilt. It's my anger. I'm not giving it up. And we'll miss the bus because we don't, we're afraid to become new. Jacob and Esau were the sons of Isaac. Jacob and Esau who fought ever since they were born. Eventually they had to come together and Esau forgave his brother. The sons of Isaac, who was brothers with Ishmael, Isaac. Most of what we are as Christians and what we believe in our church comes from Isaac and Abraham. Most of what comes from the Muslim faith came from Ishmael. You want to talk about separation. But Isaac and Ishmael came together in the end to bury their father. Jacob's son was Joseph, uh, the kid with the amazing technicolor dream coat, who was so annoying as a kid that his brothers sold him. And if you read this thing where he's, he's talking to his brothers and say, I dream that the universe revolves around me, and I dream that you bowed down to me when I was leader of the world, I would have sold the kid. But Joseph, his dreams came true. He became the leader of a nation. His brothers bowed down to him. But that would not have happened with Joseph being the man that he was at the time. He had to become new. He had to become a different person. The, the Christian church, our faith has a long history of stories where people are coming apart and coming together, and coming apart, and coming together. It's what we do. We say phrases like, I'm wrestling with that. 
It's a, whatever the topic is or whatever is going on in your life, I'm, 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 I'm wrestling with that. I always thought professional wrestling that we see on TV was, was for people who liked the idea of comic books but couldn't get the hang of the word balloons. <laughs> All right. Jacob wrestles the angel and the angel makes him a new person. He wrestled his problems into a blessing. If you are, if you are feeling apart right now, like things are coming apart, they will come together. Wrestling is the opposite of panic. If we make a decision while we are in a panic, it's almost never the right decision. Oh my God, what am I going to do? And we do something. No, it's okay to take the time and wrestle with that. Wrestling proves the idea that the outcome is bigger than ourselves. It's okay if you give it the time. It's okay if you wrestle and you don't know which way you want to do. That means you're willing to acknowledge the outcome is important. Whatever it is that you're wrestling with right now, that's okay. Because we wrestle our problems into blessings. People thought, or people think you stand there and God will ring down his blessings upon you. No, Jacob was willing to fight for his. You will give me my blessing. Sometimes we have to have something dislocated in order to get our blessings. Sometimes we have to fight for them. But wrestling is a good thing. Thus ends the lesson. Amen. Oh,